Four minutes late. And players. Well, welcome to the Q&A show with Dr. Chuck Missler. I'm Ron Matson here in Reparoa, New Zealand. We have Chuck via video link, uh, the United States. Welcome again to the program, Chuck. Nice to be there with you guys. All right. Well, we have a lot of questions. We've been gone for a couple of weeks and uh, doing different things and uh, dealing with some uh, uh, issues in the states and whatever and management. And, and so we've, we've not been able to address these things for a couple of weeks. So let's get straight in. We've got a question here from uh, Benu. He says, I'd like to know if you can predict. What's the geography? Um, I'm not sure. Um, I, th I think it's India. But uh, nonetheless, he's, he's asking questions with regards to end times religion. He says, I'd like to know if you can predict what kind of religious order the evil one would be considering to present uh, uh, in, in the present day circumstances. In other words, what, what do we expect to see? What, what's going to be the religious climate of the planet? Well, that's an easy question to answer because the answer is all of the above. In other words, I believe that we're going to see an emergence of all kinds of religious perceptions, and they're going to start to commingle. It wouldn't surprise me that you have to understand who the master architect is, and that's Lucifer himself. And he's been working on this for a long time. And I believe he's going to orchestrate a convergence of all the incorrect answers into a package. And uh, we did a study some time ago that is a provocative thing to study. We looked at the expectations of the Antichrist from about six different points of view. We, of course, took the biblical point of view and used that as a reference. But we talked about the Vatican, what the Vatican is anticipating, what the uh, Freemasons are anticipating. Uh, and, and right down the line, and what the Muslims are anticipating. And each one of these have a distinctively different expectation on the one hand, and yet you can begin to see a convergence as you study them. And so uh, obviously the uh, eschatology of Islam speaks of the Mahdi and all that, and they acknowledge Christ as a prophet but not as God, obviously, um, and uh, so on. Uh, the Vatican has the most bizarre expectation of all, as we discover that they're expecting to encounter an alien, an alien, alien in the observatory astronomy, astronomical sense, in Mount Graham in southeastern Arizona. And they're serious about that. They're, they're seriously expecting that, that kind of contact. So the point is, all of these things probably will be have some elements of actuality as we get near the end times. But I think these views all, are all going to be anti-Christ. The world will, in effect, be choosing up sides. Of, of, uh, uh, and, and so uh, these various views, whether they come from Buddha or from Islam or whatever, are going to have their counterparts, I believe. And uh, we can expect that these distinctives are going to increase as we get more and more into the end times. That's my view. Well, one of the things that you and I've talked about is one, one potential unifying factor, certainly among some of the worldwide religions, is this focus on um, uh, uh, Mary oh, really? in the Roman, yeah. Mary or Gaia, all these sort of apparitions of, of a woman uh, god, a deity sort of a thing. Yeah, this goes back to Babylon, it goes back to Semiramis. Um, there is a feminine aspect in each of these. There's actually a chapter in the Quran about Mary. And of course, the, the Catholics have deified her as a co-redemptrix and so forth. So the errors all, surprisingly, all entangle the, the, uh, the Queen of Heaven uh, in, their, in their perceptions. Uh, but that, of course, all is non-biblical, but uh, we, can, we shouldn't be surprised. In fact, the main imperative that Jesus gave us 
was be not deceived. That, that's an imperative. And it's in the present tense, which means keep on not being deceived. Now, it's something that takes a continual diligence. And the question that really asks us is how? How do you keep from being deceived? And I have, uh, obviously, the first answer is to rely on that which we know is true, namely the Bible. One of the things, in fact, I have become quite shocked at a number of things I've seen published recently that gets into wormholes and, and uh, 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 portals and all these kinds of ideas, uh, uh, encouraged, of course, by recent breakthroughs in scientific areas. But the danger I see is that many well-meaning Christians are co-mingling biblical references with non-biblical sources. And it's not that the non-biblical sources aren't true. That's not the point. I'm uh, going to be developing some materials that I'm inclined to call hermeneutical hygiene. And what I mean by that is we all would agree as Christians that the Word of God is God-breathed, it's pure, it's infallible, and so on. We, we, we give it all these uh, very real attributions. The Word of God itself is not only given to us by God, it's God-breathed. The early church had to distinguish that which was really God-breathed in contrast to some of these uh, apocryphal books. They, they refused to accept any book that was done under a pen name. They didn't feel that was appropriate, and so on and so forth. Well, there are some of these still floating around, one of which is the Book of Enoch. Now, the Book of Enoch is a very useful tool for scholarship, for vocabulary, and for understanding what they believed in those days. That's two centuries before Christ, primarily. The problem is many people get so intrigued with the Book of Enoch and some of these other materials that they give them too much credibility in comparison with the Bible. And I think I call that hermeneutical hygiene. I think we need, if we're going to acknowledge the uniqueness of the Word of God, let's keep it on that pedestal and not commingle it with these other sources of information. And I think we run a serious uh, error. And one of the challenges you and I have is to be not deceived. Jesus gives us that command again and again and again in his discourse. Be not deceived. Great. How? How do you not become, uh, get to, uh, keep from, how do you keep from being deceived? Well, one thing is the whole counsel of God, the focus on the word of God. Great. The other aspect I've come to believe is it also is a call to precision. I don't believe there are synonyms in the Bible. I think there's two words that might be synonymous that mean almost the same thing. But watch out for that almost, because it might be hiding a little nugget of truth that we'd miss otherwise. So I'm a real, ad I've become, a, after 65 years of study, I've become a serious advocate of precision in our language. The Antichrist doesn't sign a treaty, he enforces a covenant. That's not quite the same thing. And as we go through, the, the tribulation isn't seven years, it's three and a half. It's half of a seven-year period. The, the, my point is, many of these issues that we stumble through, are, we're stumbling because we haven't been precise enough. But part of that precision is, I believe, is to keep our biblical bibliography distinct from the other sources that might be very interesting and might be illuminating in some ways, but let's not confuse the two. When you read something in the book of Enoch, that doesn't mean it's true. It's not an inspired book. It may be a very useful book, but be careful. And uh, we can go on and on about that, but I, I hope that responds to this question. Well, it certainly sounds like uh, chapter one of an upcoming book that uh, you need to be writing on uh, yes. spiritual deception. Well, I am. I, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to undertake a book that will be a collection of much of what we've done. Our six volumes on angels has reached quite a market, and that seems very popular. There's much further we can do. And I'm going to focus the composite work on what I'll probably call the Cosmic Wars. Everybody remembers my book, Cosmic Codes, and it's become somewhat of a standard in terms of cryptography in the Bible. 
but this is going to be about what's going on as we speak in the metacosm. This is a warfare in that region that's outside our, our limited concept of physical reality. We have to start by dealing with the boundaries of our reality. We know that the physical reality we in ours are simply a shadow of a larger reality. And for lack of another term, I'll call that larger reality the metacosm. There is a warfare going on in that metacosm. We see glimpses, uh, the glimpses of it in Daniel chapter 10, and there's other places. So the point is that warfare isn't something future. That's going on now as we speak, and we want to focus on that. But in order to do so with some safety, we want to keep our primary focus on what the Word of God tells us. These other embellishments may be provocative, they may be worth the uh, consideration as speculations, but let's keep them separate. And I'm going to be arguing for something I'm going to start calling hermeneutical hygiene. Let's keep the Word of God distinctive and not commingled with these other sources. Well, I like that, Chuck, and I also like the idea that uh, you've thrown out a little teaser there of a, of a book that's in, uh, in, uh, in process, and uh, so no doubt our viewing audience will be uh, anticipating uh, Cosmic Wars, uh, a, a real um, uh, uh, thorough dealing with the idea of angels and demons and, and Nephilim and, uh, and apparitions and all that kind of stuff, which is part of the end time deception. But let's move on to our next question. It's a very simple question. It comes from Amber from Texas in the United States. Uh, Amber writes, please explain the difference between John's baptism and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So the, you do see these two different references of types of baptisms. What's the difference between John's baptism and baptism of the Holy Spirit? Well, first of all, John's baptism was focused on, focused on repentance. That was his message. It was a message of repentance. In fact, Apollo only knew that and had to be corrected by uh, 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 Priscilla. Uh, on understanding the real reach of real baptism, if you will, beyond that. So that's the John baptism. Now, the problem with the baptism of the Holy Spirit is only because people use that to refer to different things. What that typically is intended to be, be, be uh, he, the Holy Spirit's baptism is by fire. Now, we see that baptism in Acts chapter 2. We see it a number of places. And there are people that carry that too far in assuming that the gifts that were involved there are essential for everyone. And that's contrary to what Paul teaches us in 1 Corinthians 14. Paul talks about the gifts of the Spirit in 1 Corinthians 12, but then he highlights the problems that emerged in, in 1 Corinthians 14. And between the two, he says, I'll show you a better way. And that's, of course, 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter, as we call it. And uh, that eclipses it all. But getting back to the... Uh, Baptism of the Holy Spirit is a term that some people are using in a very specific way. And other people will use that in a broader sense as an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And it, it tends to uh, include uh, these occasions when the Holy Spirit may outpour himself uh, and anoint us in some special way during uh, our ministries. And that that isn't a necessarily a one-time thing. It, it can happen again and again. And uh, so uh, I don't know if I muddied the water, but that's, that's the way I'd respond to the question without getting into some of these uh, abuses and confusion. The, the problem is that this is an area that is subject to a lot of confusion. Well, excellent. Let's move on to something about eschatology. A lot of questions coming in from our viewers about end times things. And so I've coupled two questions back to back. One asked the question from Joan. Uh, she says, why do they say the beast is either the western leg or the eastern leg of the old Roman Empire? I believe it's both together. The woman rides the beast and the beast hates her. Catholicism and Islam joined together, have the same Jesus to deceive the world. What do you think? Well, so you're mixing a, a number of speculations there together, and that's fine. Uh, clearly, the Roman Empire did have two legs under Diocletian, and uh, the eastern leg outlasted the western leg by a thousand years. And so uh, many people, when they speak of the Roman Empire, fail. They tend to be thinking myopically of just the western half of that. 
And uh, the eastern leg outlasted, as I say, for another thousand years. So when you use the term Roman Empire, there's an ambiguity as to which one you're talking about. And that gets complicated even further when you try to lay into that whole picture of the Ottoman Empire that came along. And uh, so um, now getting back to the, uh, you're absolutely right, is that the, the, not to confuse the woman that rides the beast with the beast, because the beast is going to ultimately uh, consume her. Uh, she, uh, she takes advantage of it for a while, but he turns on her. And that's that, that is exactly what the, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the text tells us. One of the people that really unraveled that in a very interesting way is Dave Hunt. He did a book called The Woman Rides the Beast, in which he focuses on the distinctives of how the woman is different from the beast. And he really focuses on just one aspect of that, namely the Vatican. And I think the actual uh, subject is much broader than just the Vatican. But nevertheless, his book is a classic, uh, very well researched. And, and uh, I, I encourage you to take a look at that if you haven't uh, had a chance to yet. It's a very, it's a, and there are some things about it I don't agree with, but that's not either here or there. I think he did a marvelous job, a very thorough job, at highlighting a great deal about this harlot that rides the beast. And uh, clearly we're uh, going to see that climax. One of the other things that's, that is probably the ultimate final mystery in eschatology is the issue of mystery Babylon. And there are people that take that allegorically, and there are people that take it very, very literally. And I think both are true. I think there's a very literal Babylon that's destined to reemerge on the banks of the Euphrates. And that will happen in our lifetime. We'll see that emerge. And it's going to be extremely powerful politically, economically, and spiritually. And yet, it's not that simple. It's it actually is going to be a consummation of events that had their beginnings way back in Genesis chapter 11 and following. And so that's a study in its own right. And uh, people who take it just allegorically are missing the point. People that are just looking for it in some literal, narrow sense are also overlooking some of its broader features. But uh, that's, that's another challenge I leave you with. Okay, well, following on with that, we have a question from Sylvia. She's from the Faroe Islands, and she says, On your uh, June 3rd question and answer, I noted a question from Jess from Virginia, United States, who asked, If people take the mark of the beast, um, will they lose the opportunity to be saved? And there are references made to Islamic terrorists. If it is so uh, um, that uh, one cannot be saved after having taken the mark of the beast, Will this then only apply to the seven or three and a half year period of the Great Tribulation? Since we hear of several testimonies of ISIS terrorists who already have had the mark of Allah on their forehead and have converted to Christianity, telling fascinating stories of dreams, visions of angels and Jesus. So what's your thoughts there? Perhaps there's a mixture there of dealing with this issue of the mark of the beast and the name of the beast and who the beast is and the, the often references now to Islam as perhaps being that mark. So what, what are your thoughts with regards to that? Well, first of all, let's not confuse ourselves about what the mark of the beast is. The mark of the beast can't be taken until the beast is revealed. And the beast himself has not been revealed yet. A precondition to his being revealed is the harpazo, the rapture. So those events that are relevant here are events that occur after the harpazo. And after the harpazo, we have the beast will be revealed. And there will be those that will uh, 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 you know, commit their allegiance to him by receiving his mark. I think it's a presumption on our part to try to apply that to anything today because it's premature. The beast has not really been revealed yet. And in 2 Thessalonians 2, we infer from the careful study of the Greek uh, exegesis there that the, uh, the precondition uh, is the harpazo. And uh, so that means that those uh, prohibitions are yet future. Once after the after the rapture, the the uh, uh, beast will be revealed, and you'll have an identifying approach to things, and people that accept that 
will foreclose any possibility of salvation. The scripture seems to be very clear on that, right? And it, it, it raises a lot of issues. But those are issues that are academic for you and me, because we're still operating be, before the harpazo, prior to what we call the rapture. And, uh, and that, so every day that Jesus tarries is another day where you and I can improve our report card. Because we're all destined for a final exam. And every day that he carries gives me a chance to try to repair my report card. Praise God for that. Every day that he carries gives us another day to get those people that we love aware of the redemption that's available to them in Christ. And it's their choice, not ours. We can't force it on them. <laughs> try. But the point is getting them to discover the extremes that Jesus has gone to on their behalf there's still time to do that. Once the harpasa takes place, the whole uh, the whole uh, uh, game plan changes, and we need to understand that that's that'll plunge us into a dispensation that's very different than what most people are expecting. Wow. Okay, I'm going to take us to Luke chapter 18 now. This is a question from Julian. Uh, from the UK. He says, Jesus tells his disciples they must go to Jerusalem and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. Jesus describes in detail and then tells, and then we are told that he says, and they understood none of these things and these things were hid from them, neither knew they the things which were spoken. The question is this. Um, first, what is the difference between them not understanding these things and them not knowing the things that were spoken? Why do you suppose it was hidden from them at that time? That's the reason Jesus spoke in parables. And he explains all that in Matthew 13. They asked him, why do you speak in parables? And he explains, so that they as insiders would understand, the people outside would not. And that may shock many people, but parables are really used to package truth in such a way that only the ones with the Holy Spirit will understand what's going on here. And that sounds strange at first, and you got to, that's why the best explanation I think of it occurs in Matthew 13, where he really goes into all of that. But uh, uh, the, the, the fact that they were on a mission and there were aspects they didn't understand means that the Holy Spirit didn't reveal it to them for whatever reason. But uh, if he's going to reveal it to you and me, it'll be a response to our praying to him. Because he's promised that if he asks, he will explain. And so one of the thing, one of the resources you and I have is to request of the Holy Spirit to reveal these things that we might understand, that we might perceive, that we might discern, and that we might be more pleasing in his sight. Right. Excellent. Excellent. A uh, question from um, Dr. William in Florida. Uh, again, it's another end times uh, question. He says, uh, in Revelation, it says men would seek death and not find it. If the Antichrist is truly an Assyrian, an empire being reformed uh, by ISIS as we speak, then maybe this might explain that verse. ISIS seeks infidels to kill in jihad in order to get free pass into their version of heaven. What if they have conquered so many lands that most of the fighters can't find someone to kill them so they can't earn martyrdom? So the idea of seeking death and not being yeah. able to find it, I think we need to put that I in its context. Yeah, I don't follow him. He's crossed several bridges by himself there, I think. No, I think, first of all, that is a verse that puzzles me as to what it really is intended to convey. Clearly, there's a time that's so troublesome that men will seek death and not find it, is what it's saying. Um, taking that literally, I find it, trying to take it literally, a little puzzling. Because if I was set upon destroying myself, it's my presumption I'd find a way to do that. I'd wrap myself in C4 and spread myself on about 17 acres. And so, uh, uh, that is, you know, is that somehow precluded from it? I don't quite understand what that verse means. It's one of those, there's several verses, that's one of them, that I find puzzling in terms of what it really is intended to convey. But I don't connect that at all with, uh, with ISIS or beheadings or that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother set of speculations you're dealing with there. Uh, so I can't respond to that. 
Right. Okay, let's move on to another question from Revelation. This is Ben asked this question. It says, in Revelation, when the Bible talks about the seals being opened and death on the earth, does that mean that man was never able to colonize any other planet, a Mars, for example? Well, probably. In other words, first, first point, there is no evidence of life anywhere other than the planet Earth. The, the astrobiologists have a problem, because that's not a science. Science is the examination of evidence, and they haven't been able to find any evidence. And so uh, much, as, much as they have tried, there seems to be a desperate hope on the part of many that they're looking for evidence that they're, we're not alone in the universe. Well, we're not alone in the universe. God has brought us here for some purposes. But I think that, that the whole premise there of, of uh, life elsewhere is a presumption on our part. And uh, I, I don't think I can uh, prove it from Scripture necessarily, but I feel I probably could if I tried to take a look at the Scripture. It, it forecloses the uh, emergence of life as we know it uh, being anywhere on the earth. But don't get the that because there are immortals. There are angels that are good angels. There are also angels that are bad angels that have engaged in mischief. And the word angel, we tend to use to describe a being when it's really a job description. Those are messengers. Um, there are some super angels we call uh, cherubim, and they're, they're, they're military uh, kinds of creatures that protect and, and uh, so forth. And there's the seraphim. That's another kind of super angel of some kind. Here we're using the term angel in the common sense as a, a designator of a creature of some kind. A creation of God, the seraphim, the cherubim, and those things that we call angels are creations of God. There's some of them that have gone to the dark side that are evil. Um, there are angels that are not our friends. They're out to deceive us and out to destroy us. We need to understand that. And there, and there apparently is a cherub that is that was in charge of them all. That's our major enemy. He has the name of Lucifer. He's a cherub. The cherub that covered. He was the one in charge. So he's some kind of super angel. He's not an angel in the, in the pedestrian sense. He's an angel in, in some kind of super sense. And uh, so we need to understand that. And these beings are resourceful. They have an agenda. That agenda is adverse to our own. The good news is Jesus is in charge, and he's our king, and he's the one we can trust. In fact, that's the whole game, is to trust him you know, to the detriment of all of them. So you know, some of the, his questions indulged in speculations I don't share. You know. Well, one of the things one of the things that I find uh, fascinating recently is just to see how much effort is being put into the attempt to try to find evidence for life elsewhere, both within our own solar system, uh, the various expeditions to Mars are all being fueled with the idea of trying to find uh, the the uh, a genesis of life somewhere other than on the Earth, and then of course you have Stephen Hawking who has announced this uh, million, uh, gala, or million star program where they're going to look at a million um, stars that have potential planets around them. And the whole purpose is to try to give a catalog of places where life could potentially be. It's quite extraordinary, isn't it? Well, it's, a, it's just a quest that I, think, I believe is destined for failure. Now, the terrifying thing is they may find it, but they may not recognize it when they see it. And we're dealing with creatures that are not necessarily are limited to our four dimensions. We live in four dimensional space, three dimensions spatially and time. But we know, our scientists tell us, confirmed it, that we act, there are actually 10 dimensions out there. 10 of them are not directly accessible by us. I'll collectively call those the metacosm. The metacosm is loaded with creatures that are hostile to our interest. And we need to understand that. And that's going on. What's our resource then? The Word of God and the person of Jesus Christ. And the very definition of truth is when the Word and the deed become one. And He's what it's all about for us. And all these quests for life there or there are really attempts 
to find a substitute for God, to get around the, the idea of a God that holds us accountable, and, and so forth. The very premise that God has instructed us, we're trying to duck by these, these searches. And so that's just an acknowledgement of their frustration. But it's interesting that the, uh, uh, when people discover that materialism is bankrupt, where do they go next? After materialism, where do they go? The answer is mysticism. So they'll, they'll be vulnerable to other kinds of features. Life of a different form, not a hydrocarbon form of life, but some other kind of thing. Uh, something with, uh, you know, uh, creatures. And it's going to be, and we know these things are polymorphic. They change, they change. We know the, the interesting behavior of angels is they can materialize when they choose to and disappear when they do. That's not true of demons. Demons seem to be powerless except to the extent they can influence a person. And comprehensively, maybe. But uh, the angels, we have angels that took people by the hand. We have angels that indulge in combat. We have angels that. Apparently, we've entertained some unawares, according to the book of Hebrews. So, uh, angels, used it, using that term in the broad sense, is, is a, a whole other challenge for us. We did a six-volume study on that, and, and much of that materials will be you know, packaging into our cosmic war materials. You know. And you also did, of course, that uh, uh, you know, uh, classic work, uh, Alien Encounters, came out so many years ago. It was really a pioneering work in the idea of, of, of linking uh, a lot of the uh, UFO um, um, craze that was taking place, but showing that things weren't coming across great distances of, of the galaxy, but they were transdimensional beings. And that's also another aspect of this, isn't it? They're, they don't need to look out great distances into the universe. These beings that are, uh, that are manifesting themselves are doing so through, um, uh, through the sense of being transdimensional. Yeah, most, uh, most competent researchers in this area have concluded these are not intergalactical, they're interdimensional. And, uh, and that, that, actually, that actually clarifies a great deal. Well, let's move on to our next question. This is from Holly from Florence, Kentucky. Uh, she says, uh, you stated on your show that the safest place to be is in the center of God's will. How do I know if I am in his will or not? Simple question, but very powerful. It's a very great question. It's probably the key question. Uh, there is a quote that I've been starting to use a great deal. And the quote comes from all people from a guy by the name of Mark Twain. And he says the two most important days in a person's life is the day that he's born and the day he discovers why. And so, yes, discovering your calling uh, is the big chance. That's the adventure of life. And it's a lifetime pursuit to discover what it is that God has for you. And that's a pursuit of him and a, a development of a relationship with him. And uh, if, the, if the people are fond of giving people a little uh, uh, a check verse to accept Christ and so on, and, and uh, that's fine. But the real issue is your personal relationship with Christ. Do you have a relationship with him? and developing that and trusting. I believe that God finds a new way every day to ask the same question. Every day, I believe God asks, do you trust me? And your response to that can be called faith, can be called hope, it can be called many things, but he seems to just cherish your trust in him. And uh, many of the ways you offend him is by not trusting him, and, uh, but uh, trying to really confirm what it is that he uh, has for you as your calling is the challenge in life. There's no little good answer. There isn't a little check verse I can give you. It's a, it's a courtship between you and him, and he really loves you more than you can possibly imagine, and part of the courtship is for you to discover that and to start trusting him more. And as you trust him more, these things will become clearer and more comfortable and more centered, simple in your life. And that's a candid answer. It's not a glib formula, but it's the real answer. Your personal relationship with him to 
to love it. And, he, and he'll do the, the biggest part. Is his, he challenges you. Be my word and, you will, and, and he'll, he'll prove himself to you. He'll take the responsibility to reveal himself to you. And depending what you do with the piece of truth he gives you, that's what will determine what he does next. And uh, it's, it's a courtship. But it's a relationship. It's, it, 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 it develops. And, uh, and that's one of the things that uh, uh, we desperately want to develop. Absolutely. I've got another question that follows on with that. Really, some basic issues here. It's from um, a man named Paras. And we'll find out from his, uh, from his letter to us that he's, uh, he's originally from India, now living in Illinois. But let me give you his question. He says, through this ministry and others, I have come to know Jesus. What do I have to do after I believe in the cross and creation? Do I have to be born again to be saved? Or just sure. does it require faith? What does it mean to be a born again Christian? What a great question. And Chuck, so fundamental. And yet here's someone from India. He's discovered uh, the reality of, of Christ, but now he's asking the question, what must I do to be saved? What would you say to, to, to his question? And your salvation will involve you becoming a new creation. That's what we mean by being born again. And your priorities, your perspective of life will alter and, uh, in terms of that relationship. And uh, that's what we really need. And you, you, will, you will discover you are a new creation. And uh, God doesn't repair the old man. He replaces it with a new creation. And, uh, and that's, that, that's what you will see emerge. And that's, that's the staggering truth that uh, you'll be embracing as it occurs. Uh, Ron, help me here. I'm missing a better way to express that. <laughs> well, the, the whole aspect of, of being saved, um, you, just, you of course come back to that term born again is born out of John chapter 3 as, as uh, Jesus is speaking to Nicodemus and he speaks of a, a, a father procreated relationship that, that emanates from the father. It, it's not something that a religious person, which Nicodemus was, could do for himself. That's why he is puzzled by the statement that Jesus says you must be born uh, from above, you must be born again. And uh, uh, people that especially come from a religious background struggle with that because all other world religions are all about what man can do to reach God. And Christianity is all about what God will do in the obedient heart that approaches God through the completed work of Jesus Christ. And uh, um, that would be my encouragement um, to uh, Paras is to seek him with all his heart and the Holy Spirit will guide and direct him uh, as he responds to the message of the gospel, the cross and the resurrection of Jesus Christ or the things that he needs to place his faith on as being evidence of the completed work of Christ in his life. The Bible uses the term Benai our heaven womb, uh, 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 sons of God. Adam is a direct creation of God, so he's a son of God. You and I are not. We're sons of Adam. The people, the, the Benai Elohim phrase is used in Adam only, and the angels, and those other things that God created directly. That's what the term implies. And in Luke, we even find that in the New Testament, that they, uh, those that receive them, to them he gave he them the power to become the sons of God. What happens when you receive that new creation of God is you are regarded as a totally new creation. You are no longer a son of Adam, you're a son of God. And, and uh, so that's part of the dynamic that uh, you'll be experiencing. And it's very, very real. And it's, very, it's the most precious thing in your life. Amen to that. Let's move on to now a very prickly question. It's on the same sort of uh, topic, but it comes from a whole, totally different uh, perspective. It's uh, from Maggie from Tasmania, so down here in the South Pacific where, uh, where we are in New Zealand. Uh, she's off of, obviously, Australia and Tasmania. And she says, I am a dissenting Catholic. I have left the church because the priest encouraged me to read the Bible, which I did and discovered that the practice of praying to Mary and venerating statutes and symbols of her is in fact sin. If Catholics practice um, uh, saying the rosary and praying and venerating Mary, even when they have a true love from God, will they be in the kingdom of God? That's a real prickly question. What's your response to that, Chuck? 
Well, I think it's uh, fortunately it's not my voice, it's his. That's for him to sort out. And clearly, there are many Catholics that really love Jesus, that really understand who he is, that are uh, maybe entangled in some of these other things that are non-biblical. But I believe that uh, as a, a, if they're sincerely committed to the Lord Jesus, that they're saved, even though they're carrying baggage that is impressed upon them by these traditions. And uh, clearly, the ins insight of uh, Tasmanian print is that uh, the, the, uh, the, the Bible and Catholicism are diverse. Catholicism does not embrace biblical truth. They'll, they, they'll give it some lip service, but they really, the, the whole issue becomes one of authorities. And for them, the church is the authority for the, the uh, for the believer, the authority is the word of God. And she's made that key transition to recognize the Bible is our guide. The Bible lays it out. And, uh, uh, and some of the other things have to fall where they do. And a lot of people who dis that, that discover all that get very upset because there are a lot of Catholics that are being mistaught, that are adopting things that are non-biblical, and I don't have any good answers for that, except they are non-biblical. But I think in that area, there are people that doesn't mean, that doesn't mean they're not saved. There are people there that are, uh, 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 by Jesus' standards, his. And uh, fortunately, that's his choice, not mine. All right. I'm going to take you now to a question that is a current event, and there you're in the United States, and this is something that's uh, fairly recent. Um, the question is about the Supreme Court decision with regards to same-sex marriage. The question is, what should we expect to see? And when considering the recent Supreme Court decision, I ask in light of this, of your Learn the Bound 24-hour study where you define the real sin of Sodom and Gomorrah. So they're, they're asking the question, uh, Chuck, when, when a country makes a stand, um, as the United States Supreme Court has, what does the Bible it. say? What does the Bible say well, about first, that? Well, first of all, the, the Supreme Court has overstepped. They've made a travesty of the whole concept of the law. There is a reaction brewing to all of that in many states. There are, there's a 200-page study done by one of our board members, William Welton, that is being published that shreds the, the, uh, the, the, the decision that was handed down. But more than that, it, uh, Chriselle Peterson is designing a poster-sized declaration with the intent that it could be signed and placed in the narthex of churches. Many churches are distancing themselves from the U.S. government. The U.S. government doesn't define marriage. God does. And that's the position of many churches. There is a backlash brewing that's very, very exciting. There are people that are finally waking up to the fact that the church is late in waking up to this whole issue. And there are many churches that are finding ways to declare themselves independent of, of Washington as far as their belief systems are concerned. And, uh, and I'm, I'm getting rumbles across the country from some people in very high places that there is a civil disobedience uh, brewing. Hopefully it stays civil uh, disobedience. But the point is, there's a, there's a huge rift beginning. The, the Supreme Court overstepped. And it's going to be interesting to see what the results of that is. The result may be chaos of a form. But it is going to be a, a, an arena in which churches are going to uh, have an opportunity to stand up and be called Christian. Well, one of the things about the Supreme Court decision, of course, is uh, within the United States and the impact on uh, many churches in the states is the, the unique position that churches find themselves being um, not only a religious organization, but corporations that are granted charity status. And uh, they may find themselves, if they take a, a view that's political, they may have to uh, give up that, um, that state-recognized uh, charity status, which many of them have benefited 
uh, from. But uh, the, the sense of, of, of frustration, anger, and as you put out, backlash is quite clear within the United States and, uh, and elsewhere in the world where, where they're feeling that this is a, an agenda that's being forced down the throat of uh, the common person worldwide. And it is, and it's being orchestrated by Lisa for himself. Wow, that's amazing. Moving on now, I'm going to take you to a question uh, from 1 John chapter 5, verse 18. Uh, it comes from Peggy from Florida. She writes, I'd like to know if Chuck would please expound on the following very puzzling verse. Um, so verse 18, we know that whoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, that the wicked one touches him not. I know that Jesus is the one begotten of God and that we are born of God, but I just don't quite get what this verse is trying to say. So how would you unpack that for her, Chuck? It is a confusing verse. It's a confusing verse, but I think we deal in central limits as dealing with we should have a drive to be free of sin. Will we be really free of sin? No. We'll stumble, we'll make mistakes. But we won't let it persist. We won't let it be in control of our lives. Uh, the... the uh, the whole idea is that we, the, the empowerment we have through the Holy Spirit is he makes it possible for us to deal with that. And our goal is to be free of that sin, not subject to its rulership over us. And I think that, to me, that's the key thought that's being addressed today. I don't know if that helps or confuses it further. I've got a question from Mark. He says, uh, what are your thoughts about the Kurds or Medes in Bible prophecy? How do they fit into the end time scenario? Well, I'd read the text and see you. They're very prevalent in the end time scenario. The Medes, I believe, are the, what we call the Kurds today. And there's several, they're, the, they're a people without a country. And uh, one of the counterbalancing complications in the Middle East is the role of the Kurds in their various locations in Iraq and in uh, Turkey and elsewhere. And so uh, 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 my recommendation there is just clearly they're major players at the end times. They are major players in the end times. And they're somehow entangled with Iran. So that's mentioned several times in several interesting places. But I think that our challenge is just to read the text and watch. Because it's all unfolding before our very eyes. So I think this is a tough... Uh, I think it's... Be careful not to try to enter into divination. Divining is trying to predict the future. Prophecy is not given to divination. It's not to tell us the future in advance. What it is to is to glorify God when it does happen. So our challenge is to study it and understand it so we recognize it when it does happen. But don't enter into divination. That's a, a trap we should avoid. Excellent. Phil from Atlanta, Georgia asks this question. He said, I've heard Chuck on more than one occasion mention that President Obama is a practicing Sunni Muslim. While I don't doubt that this is true, I am curious as to what kind of evidence is out there to back up those claims. I truly appreciate any insight or clarity that you can provide. So you, you made that statement many times, Chuck. What's the basis of it? Well, he, he admits it in his biographies. And not only that, he has given a title. I forget what the word is in Arabic. But there's a word they use for one that does his devotions in Arabic. And Obama has done that from the beginning, from, the, from his youth. And so he is a practicing Sunni Muslim. It shows up in his writings. It shows up in his actions. And uh, so that's, that's uh, no secret. What's amazing is how the media declines to make any reference to it. And uh, that's in itself a provocative phenomenon. That's, that is a, a violation of a trust. The purpose of the media you know, in, a, in a democracy is to inform the electorate. And our media has gone to great lengths to hide the truth from the electorate. And can you name, name a game? Can you name a grade of any course he's taken? Can you think of any job, that he, any real job that he's had? You know, it, it, it's an astonishing to make a list of the things you don't know. And it's the job of the media to dig those things out. But uh, the conspiracy that we're victims of is really astonishing. And the mainline media is in lockstep 
shielding the truth about this guy that occupies the Oval Office. It's amazing. And so, yeah, but do your homework. Read his biographies. And you'll find there's no secret. And uh, Jerry Corsi's got all kinds of materials published about the, the details of all this. I encourage you to do some homework. Well, he's also an individual who uh, seems to really shy away from uh, vilifying or identifying Islam as anything other than peaceful. Uh, he's always uh, anxious to identify the uh, the lone wolf uh, uh, sort of um, uh, uh, terrorist that also happens to be a Muslim as some kind of uh, of anomaly, and that especially with with Sunni Muslim uh, wants to really show it as something very moderate and uh, and peace loving. And uh, it's strange as a president of the United States that he would be so passive with regards to especially the Sunni Muslims. Well, there's a, there's a lie that gets promoted, that, the, that Islam is a peaceful religion. That's a, lie, that's a double lie. It's not peaceful. It, the Quran is a warrior code. And it's not a religion. It's much more than just a religion. It's an agenda of conquest. It's a legal system. It's about seven different things you can list in which religion is but one of them. No, Islam is the threat. And most of what... Um, Obama is charged to do is to deceive, cover up. You need to understand that in Islam, it's okay to lie. You need to understand that that is, if it's in the interest of Islam, you're encouraged to lie if that's helpful. So what he says is meaningless. What he does is the clue to who he really is. And how can we, at this late stage, be fighting ISIS without a strategy? You've got to be kidding. That should tell you volumes right there. Well, it's the, at the moment, it's the, uh, ISIS is the uh, primary destabilizing factor in the Middle East, and yet nobody seems to have any other plan other than uh, uh, ineffective airstrikes, uh, which are just more of a, of a symbol of uh, military superiority rather than dealing with specific targets and uh, trying, to, trying to push back a group which is aggressively uh, not only conquering, but, but recruiting from around the world. Uh, people are coming from all sorts of cultures, from the United States, from Europe, uh, uh, from, the, from Africa and elsewhere, to join this group, believing that they are the fulfillment of their own end, uh, Islamic end times eschatology. Let me go to another question. This will be the last one we can get into it in this session. Uh, it's from Matthew from Vancouver, Canada. He says, I was born a Muslim and praise the Lord I'm now saved and a Christian now. I have a question for Chuck. Chuck is saying the speed of light is getting slower. That has been proven. But on the other hand, he speaks about time was shorter in the past. Aren't these two the same when velocity equals distance divided by time? Uh, so if time is getting longer and uh, speed gets slower, am I missing something or have I completely misunderstood what Chuck is saying? So the speed of light well, slowing down, what does that mean? Well, it's slowing down, but it's asymptotic to where it is now. In other words, it's, the amount of change was greater in the past than it is now. And that's something that's uh, been widely documented. It was very, very innovative when Barry Setterfield and Trevor Norman first announced it um, more than 20 years ago. Uh, but today it's uh, been widely acknowledged, and uh, you can, in fact, the big topic today is the zero-point energy issue. But the real point is, yeah, the, the, the speed of light was much faster in ancient times. But uh, you're dealing with, you know, in, 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 as I recall, to do the math, in the days of Abraham, it was probably 100,000 times faster, strangely enough. That's also what allowed dinosaurs to exist. If they failed us just today, they wouldn't, there's not enough time for signals to get from the brain to their body and back. About 40, 40 seconds in, in using today's speed. It turns out, surprisingly, the size of creatures is, is imp impacted by the speed of light. Um, and uh, Barry Satterfield has done an incredible monograph on this whole topic called the Zero Point Energy. And I encourage you to, to Google uh, Barry Satterfield and see if you get a can't copy of his monograph. It's very, very provocative. But the point is, is uh, the, the amount of change today, it's, it's changing so little you wouldn't notice it. 
Excellent. Okay, well, we've come to the end of our, of our hour. Um, uh, Chuck, we've got many more questions. We'll pick it up next week. For those of you that are watching on YouTube, thank you very much for taking the time uh, to review these and keep sending the questions in to questions at kitrust.org. And uh, we'll try to pick them up as, uh, as and when we have uh, uh, chances in the future sessions. But uh, nonetheless, may God continue to bless you as you study his word and he reveals his truth to you. God bless you. God bless you indeed.